Today on Lemon Talk TV, we're going to look at Indian English, a dialect of English spoken by 265 million people across India. And that's more than the whole of Britain. We're going to look at the pronunciation, the vocabulary, the grammar. And to guide me on this linguistic rickshaw, I have our pundit all the way from India, Ajay. Namaskar. Namaskar, Gideon. First of all, Ajay, who are you and where are you from? Fantastic. Thanks for that, Gideon. Uh, I'm Ajay and I'm from the small city of Solapur in Maharashtra. Uh, I currently work in software sales with uh, global clients for a company called Profit.co. What languages do you speak? That's a very interesting question because I speak four languages. Two of them are Indian ones, Marathi and Hindi. I also speak English and German as European languages. We won't really go into German today, <laughs> but it's nice that you, you, you speak it. So. Can you say a little bit more about um, the languages of India? Marathi, that's a, that's, is it similar to uh, Hindi? There are hundreds of languages in India and about 22 of the major languages have been recognized in the Indian constitution. Marathi is one of them. It is similar to Hindi, but language is relatively different. The writing is different, also the pronunciations are quite different. But yeah, they derive from the same, uh, same parent language, Devanagari. Is English sort of a language of communication across India or is it Hindi or how does that work? In India, <coughs> Hindi is the primary language uh, that is commonly used for communication across most parts of India. Except in southern India, you would find people uh, fluently speak in English as the parent language to communicate. But overall, if you look at the professional community in India, uh, English is again a very common language to communicate in. I've got some statistics about Indian English and they're a bit confusing and contradictory because one statistic I found said yeah, mm -hmm. 265 million people speak English and another one says 129 pe million people speak English. Mm -hmm. Whichever it is, it's a lot of people. But in your experience, uh, what kind of percentage going around of people are, are fluent in English. If you go onto the streets of your town, will they know English or is it just like the educated, highly educated uh, people? Uh, I think in India, about 25% <coughs> of population can communicate in English. I wouldn't call them fluent, but about one in four people would be able to communicate with you in English really well. So uh, from that statistical standpoint, I would say it's on the higher end. And you learned English, what, at, uh, at school? So most schools in India today offer English as the second language. Okay. And, and most schools have three languages that are taught to kids. Uh, second language is English. And some of the subjects like uh, mathematics and science are offered in English in most of the schools in India. We're going to look at pronunciation, some grammar, mm -hmm. some expressions. Mm -hmm. We're going to start with pronunciation. There are many Indian Englishes, aren't mm -hmm. there? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Not all the languages have a, a, a variation, is that, is that correct? Yes. So, so Marathi, they may speak one form of Indian English and it's different. I would say the mother tongue uh, of a person, which is one of the many Indian languages, has a vast impact on what kind of Indian English is spoken by each person. Okay. So it's, yeah. All right, okay. Well, we'll look at that. Right, we're going to look at the O sounds, the big round O sounds, as in don't. 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 Yeah, don't. don't. I can hear the, the, the D is very different. We'll come to that later. So the sentence I have, don't go to the show, it's closed. Don't go to the show, it's closed. Don't go to the show, it's closed. Yeah. Sorry for my poor Indian That's English, what I'm but saying. I'm trying yeah. to learn from you. Next one is the or sound, as in short and court. Mm -hmm. How do you say that? Short. Short. Court. Caught. Taught. 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 Okay, so that's very different. I have a sentence here. I thought I taught the short daughter. I thought I taught the short daughter. Wow. I was going to try, I'm not sure I should. I thought, I taught the short daughter. I said nothing. 
that's but, uh, they, they won't give me a visa now to get to India, <laughs> not, not with that um, pronunciation. But, but we've got more to come. Mm-hmm. Going to get better. I hope you're, you're following at home. Now, next one. This is interesting. Diphthongs pronounced as monothongs. What does that mean? In my form of English, you have words like our, our drink, but in Indian English, it is so our, our, our. Okay, however, uh, but in Indian English, it's one sound. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, it's R. R. Yeah. And you pronounce the R. We're going to come to the R in, in a second. So our is R. Yeah, R. What about H O U R? R. Also R. Yeah. And it, say, it says here again. I've I've done my research, but what you tell me might be different. Like a word like fear. Is in, in English, it's it's kind of two vowels. Uh, fear and in Indian English? Fear. Fear. Okay. So you can hear the difference. So the sentence I have, I fear our beer is sour. I fear our beer is sour. Sour. Yeah, sour. What's sour? Sour. Not really tasty. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, I got one more sentence, just because that was so different. Now is the meal hour. Now is the meal hour. Okay, good, good. Right, now we're coming on to the R sounds. Now, according to my research, um, the R is pronounced very differently across India, but where you come from, it's, having spoken to you also, it's very strong. It's, it's a, 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 first it's rhotic, which means that um, the, uh, the R is pronounced at the end of words and after a vowel sound. So in my uh, accent, I would say butter. You can't really hear the R, uh, but in, uh, but you would say butter. 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 Okay. And mother. Mother. Car. Car. Okay. You can really hear the difference, can't you? And also, there's a kind of a tapped R. So in a word like uh, trial, you can hear my R is very soft. But in your English, you say trial. Great. Great. Ah, uh, there you are. That's a good example. That's. Did you hear that? Ah, that sort of tapped up. Great. Is great. that right? Do I say? It? Do I say? It? Do I say it? Okay. Similar, I would say. Great. Great. Mm-hmm. Not great. Right. Yeah. Great. And the T is strong. We'll come on to that uh, later. Grapefruit. Grapefruit. I poured butter on my computer in Bangalore. I poured butter on my computer in Bangalore. Yeah. Is that still qualified yeah. as English? Yeah, that's... <laughs> they're strong R's, definitely. The T's, the P's, and the K's are not uh, aspirated. What do I mean by that? So in British, maybe or, or they, maybe they are aspirated, but to a much lesser uh, degree. So, for example, in my English, I would say... Um, Paris, and if I, if I put my, uh, this piece of paper in front of my mouth, Paris, Pune, and you can hear it. But in Indian English, it's kind of different sounds. Maybe you can dem- demonstrate. I've got a sentence. Maybe I'll read the sentence to you. In Pune and Paris, people prefer pickled pineapple. Oh, yes. In Pune and Paris, people prefer pickled pineapples. Okay. Can you do the thing, the, the, the paper test? Let's see. In Pune and Paris, people prefer the pickled pineapple. It hardly moves, you see? You know I say? In Pune and Paris, people prefer pickled pineapples. I suppose we conserve energy when we speak as well. <laughs> you kind of like purse your lips. Okay, that's good. But it's, it's a similar thing with the T, um, which is kind of produced in Indian English, produced a little bit further back in the mouth than in my accent. In my accent, the T is, again, it's aspirated, so it's a t- take a trip to Kolkata to try the roti. It's tasty. <clears throat> take a trip to Kolkata to try the roti. It is tasty. Roti. Roti. 
Rot is a plural, isn't it? No. It's a singular? Yeah. Okay. Take a trip to Kolkata to try the roti. It's tasty. <laughs> no movement. Take a trip. There you are. Sorry. Uh, the K as well is, uh, again, um, more aspirated in my accent. So the cow comes from Karnataka. The cow comes from Karnataka. And now the TH sound. In British English, there are two TH sounds. There's a voiced TH and an unvoiced TH. So a voiced TH would be something like the and these. It's a, a, it's a fricative. And the unvoiced TH would be something like uh, thing or thirsty. But in Indian English, they don't have that. According to my notes, you can confirm that. So, thirsty? Thirsty. Them? Them. The? The. Thing? Thing. It says here in, in my notes that sometimes they're pronounced like a T in a, or a D. Or in a D. Indian, in Indian D, English. yes. So, D is T-H-E. The lion. The lion? Yeah. Okay. The lion is the king of the world. <laughs> the lion is the king of the forest. <laughs> I've got I've, my sentence I got, nothing about lions, but I hope you like it. Um, thanks for these things, brother. Thanks for these things, brother. Okay. The V and the W are the same. So wheel and veal sound the same. Wheel and veal, yes. So wheel it's the same. And veal. Yes, it is the same. But it's not the same. Yes, I can see that in the notes. But uh, I think that's how we pronounce it. How do you okay. guys say it? Wheel and veal. Oh, wheel and veal. Usually from the context, if you want to change the wheel, mm. probably it's going to be okay from the context because you don't change the veal. Vile and vile. Yeah, vile and vile. So both are like a V. Same, from yes. the, in My accent, okay. So the, the sentence I got... The vast waters of West Varanasi. The vast waters of West Varanasi. Say waters again? Waters. I say, do say waters like a W. Yes. Mm. So, it's, so it's, it's changeable, variable. Waters. Vast. Waters. Yes, it is a little changeable. Oh, interesting. Now, this one is really interesting, a little bit difficult. And one of the features of Indian English now, it tends to be syllable rather than stress timed. Now, what do I mean by that? So, in uh, my English, uh, you kind of, kind of, the music is like stressing the word and going up and down according to, to what uh, word you want to emphasize. So, for example, what are you going to do now? And but in Indian, Indian English, it's less pronounced, uh, well... I'm going to ask uh, Ajay to, to try and say that sentence, so just give a demonstration, that'd be the best thing. What are you going to do now? Okay, so you don't stress the now. Not really. Okay, so that, that's, that's, a, that's, that's, I think that's one of the difficult features if you're learning Indian English, isn't it, to change the whole stress thing. Um, and another, just to give you another example, there was an elephant in the kitchen. 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 Okay. Okay, so that's going to take some practice. So, another feature of Indian English is that sometimes the words are pronounced as they are spelt, which you think, well, yeah, it should be like that. Uh, but in, I think there are more silent letters in British English and maybe in American English, whereas in Indian English, some of these silent letters letters are actually said. So the example I got is I'm climbing a mountain with half a sword. I'm climbing a mountain with half a sword. Okay, oh, so it's half is half. Half. Okay, so you don't pronounce the L, but sword you pronounce the W. Yes. And the climbing you pronounce the B. Yes. Okay, so you've got to just be aware of that. So sometimes um, silent letters are not silent. In Indian English, they tend to use the present continuous more than in 
my English. So, for example, uh, I say I don't understand you, and in according, according to my research, an Indian might say, I'm not understanding you? Yes, I'm not understanding you. Okay. I like this book. I'm liking this book. Where do you come from? I'm coming from India. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. You come from, and the question would be, where are you coming from? Would it be? Correct. Okay. Very well. Question tags. Right, so in English, you know, you have, in, in my form of English, you have a vast array of question tags. Uh, you won't be here tonight, will you? Or, or um, it, it, it doesn't work, does it? But in Indian English, they tend to use, isn't it? For everything, is that right? You're, you're going to Mumbai this evening, isn't it? Is, is that, how would you say that? I think many Indians would say it like that. You're going to Mumbai this evening, isn't it? Some would also say, you're going to Mumbai mm -hmm. this evening, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what about, she's not wrong, isn't it? They would also say that. Yes, very common. She's not wrong, isn't it? Okay, now what's interesting, in British English, especially London, we also say like that. She's not wrong, in it? And the theory is that London English has been influenced by the large number of Indian uh, migrants into London um, since the Second World War, and that's why we say, I doubt this theory, I think it's more of a coincidence, but that is a theory. So it's one thing we might have in common from London and in India, in it, possible. Finally, our contribution towards English culture. <laughs> that big contribution, but you don't say in it, do you? No, not in it. Not yet, anyway. I suppose, yeah, not yet. Also, I could read my notes here. Also, it's often placed at the end of a sentence rather than before the verb. So the example I have: I went to see Harish. Later, I will see Gita also. Now, is that is that? Correct, according to... I would agree with that. Uh, people often use also at the end. Okay. Do they use it in the beginning also? <laughs> Not really. No. Just at the end. Okay. I went to Mumbai. I will go to Delhi also. Non-countable nouns are countable in Indian English. So, in uh, my English, I'd say um, furniture, a lot of furniture, but in Indian English... Furnitures? Yes. One, and informations, does that exist? Uh, it, it depends to a large extent on what kind of person you're talking to and where he or she is from. But yes, many people would say furnitures and woods and informations and stuff like that. When you say many people, you're trying to say not you? Not me. Yes. Okay. I paid attention in school. <laughs> okay. Only often used for emphasis. Uh, for example, are you reading a book? I am doing that only. Yes, this is very common in India to emphasize uh, using only. I'm in my room only. Which means I'm not anywhere else. I'm definitely in my room. Yes. If, for example, if my mother asks me, Ajay, why aren't you in your room on the phone? And I'm like, I'm in my room only, mom. Okay. Okay, so in, in, in my English, you would say, I am in my room. Like you would stress the am or something. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I am in my room. and in, I'm in my room only if I'm just trying to understand it. Is that, is that right? Absolutely. Why are we going to Pune this evening? We're going to Pune only. So that would mean we are going to Pune. Yes. That's the grammar done. Time for the vocabulary. You'll enjoy this, I promise you. It's very interesting Indian expressions, many of which I weren't familiar with at all. First one, Ajay, thank you for joining us. Oh, to... mention not. <laughs> you knew what I was going to say. No, I say don't mention it, but in Indian, mention not. Yes. I'm not sure where it came from, but it is very commonly practiced in India. Okay. Instead of saying just like that, you say, like that only. Yes. I can't think of an example. Uh, are we bicycling to the school? Yeah, we're going like that only. Thank you. Okay. 
Now, this one I've come across myself. I can confirm that I've come across it uh, even in, uh, in, in, in London. Uh, the, the word for meat in Indian English is not vegetarian. Is that right? Yes. We, we often refer to all meat as non-veg. Non-veg. Uh, that's interesting because uh, this actually came up yesterday. Uh, we were uh, with um, another friend and you asked, mm -hmm. uh, do you eat non-veg? <laughs> yeah. And you had to like... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, re rephrases and say, do, do, do you eat meat? Correct. Now yeah. I'm learning the correct form of English. <laughs> <laughs> do you eat non-veg? Do you eat meat? That's interesting. Well, it's technically correct though. Yes. Because, yeah, it's not. Meat, meat. is non-veg. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is, that, is, that, is the reason for that because like some Indians, a lot of Indians are vegetarian and it's quite sensitive to talk about meat? Is, that, is there a reason for that or is it just the way it is? Uh, traditionally, I think a few decades ago, there have been different cohorts of people that just used to eat vegetarian vegetable food. And then uh, I think naturally now the culture has changed and evolved. But uh, yeah, it was a taboo to eat meat or non-veg, which is why mm. there was a clear distinction between veg and non-veg. Okay. I, I remember I spent uh, some time in um, Mumbai a couple of years ago. I remember passing a restaurant and there was a sign apologizing, sorry, we now serve non-veg. Oh. And it was uh, like a big apology. <laughs> so I was curious. I totally resonate with that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now this is another one. Again, from my childhood, because I should tell you, like, I grew up in London and in my neighborhood. It was quite an, an Indian, lots of Indian immigrants in my neighborhood. And uh, this one resonates with me, because I saw it everywhere. And that is cash and carry. And I thought, oh, always as a kid, so what, what's the thing with cash and carry? What is the thing with cash and carry? It means that uh, you have to pay up front to get something from that store. And uh, they wouldn't really lend you anything that you can pay afterwards. So you, you can't buy on credit? Yeah, no credit. Okay, was that, did that used to be a common thing? Yes, in India it was very common for neighborhood grocery stores to extend credits, credit to families that live in that neighborhood. So typically any family would just have a page in the registry of that uh, grocery store and would settle all expenses at the end of the month. But that practice has slowly been removed, uh, and that's why they probably mentioned cash and carry. Only. Okay, so it means pay now. Okay. Uh, another one you might come across, I've come across this in, uh, how do you pronounce it? Lakh? Lek? Lakh. Lakh. That's 100,000. Yes, one lakh. That apartment cost me $300,000. That apartment cost me three lakh. Correct. In fact, it's much easier. We should adopt that. Yes. <laughs> 300,000 words. It's, uh, luck is just one short word. Yes. Also, Definitely. we have a word for 10 million, which is karor. Karor? Yeah. Oh, I've not come across that. <laughs> so, how, does that work for people as well or for money? Yes. How many people live in this country? Well, one karor. Yes, absolutely. The population of Mumbai recently just exceeded one karor. Ooh. That's really useful. We, we, should, we, should, we should use that one. I've come across this one too, Tiffin. Tiffin. According to my research, depends on where you are in India. Sometimes it's a snack, sometimes it's lunch. Mm -hmm. I would say most of the times it is lunch. Okay. Is it time for Tiffin? Uh, I think in a few minutes, maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, this one, this one I love. I've never heard it before. Uh, Air Dash. Flying somewhere without preparation. Oh, this one is new for me as well. I never come across this. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, in I fact, you're the first it. English person to tell me this as an Indian English word. Okay, well, I, I guess, uh, well, India's so vast, there are uh, even different varieties of Indian English. All right, we'll move on to the next one. Ajay, you're in my way. Can't you adjust? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> is, is that correct? Is that... Yes. So I think if you ask someone to do something as a favor, instead of saying, please do this, uh, Indians would offer refer to say, kindly adjust. Okay, so if I get on the Delhi metro and people are standing in front of me, mm -hmm. well, I would say, kindly adjust, means get out of my way. 
you could say that but it is more common in professional uh, business communication uh, okay in which you say uh, you know we don't have any anyone to take a meeting at 8 pm uh, kindly adjust that's good again that's very really useful cousin brother british english most forms of english cousin is gender neutral we don't know if it's male or cousin or a female cousin but in indian english you do we cousin feel brother? the need yeah we feel cousin. the need to specify the gender like my cousin brother is coming to the wedding but, my cousin sister but you gave me a reason for that when we were talking earlier you... uh, i think for a long time we used to just refer to cousins as brothers or sisters but then uh, i think just to bring more clarity we started to refer them as cousins but then as gideon pointed out it is gender neutral and we ne- felt the need to specify the gender as well time pass waste of time yeah total this Can meeting is total time pass i hope you're not going to no one's going <laughs> to get the idea this this video is a total time pass <laughs> please don't put that in the comments please. just a joke indians also shorten many words to create commonly used terms so for example enthusiasm comes enthu mm-hmm. the new recruit has a lot of enthu yes uh, i would say it, it means enthusiastic so you would just say the new recruit is very enthu okay and also some time phrases are different in indian english instead of this morning today morning instead of last night yesterday night now in in my english in all englishes you can postpone something to a later date but in indian english you can also prepone it bring it forward i used to think that was just ordinary before this meeting but now i realize it's something unique yes you well, can we should things. we should use it <laughs> absolutely it's perfectly logical and good do the needful do the needful is uh, again just do whatever is required to get that done so if you were to write an email to your colleague saying that you know this this client requires this information by this evening you would just say please do the needful and this one i love and it's got history to it instead of out of town you might say out of station is that right yes hmm. i'm curious where that came from though i've i've got i did some research i've got the answer but first of all I, so if if you say uh, are you are you coming for lunch today you coming for tiffin Oh, so well, now I can't. I'm out of station. Is it like that? No, the person himself can't say that I'm out of station because it literally means that the person is not in that ah, town. Ah, okay. So uh, you can just say, "Hey, is Gideon coming for lunch with us today?" And uh, somebody else might say, "No, Gideon, Gideon is out of station today." The you want to know history? Okay, here's the history. The phrase has its origins in the posting of army officers to particular stations. during the days of the East India Company. Oh really? Well I'm going to advocate for people to stop using that now. <laughs> okay, so so as some sort of colonial history. Reduplication. Okay, this is just when you repeat a word for emphasis. For example, uh, instead of saying, "Hey, my English is, hey, come here." In English English, in Indian English, you might say, "Come, come, sit." it's it uh i would just say sit once <laughs> like maybe repeat one of those things come come sit with us and if the food is in in lying is in front of me my tiffin is in front of me and you I'm, might even say eat eat in indian english you don't say what's your name you say what's your good name mm-hmm. what's this all about frankly i don't know why but uh, i have only heard people ask for my good name ever I think it's an assumption in which all names are good a kind of maybe a little bit of respect as well. Does What's that re- your good name? Does that refer to your first name, your first surname name. Or, or both? First name only. First name only. Okay. Yeah. Let's speak Indian. We're going to put all these things together and we've got a few expressions to Let's go. First one. My cousin says she wants to eat meat for lunch. Uh my cousin's sister wants to eat non-veg for lunch only. I was out of town last night, but it was a complete waste of time. Uh I was out of station yesterday night, but it was a total time pass. 
He's really enthusiastic and wants to bring forward the meeting. Oh, he's really into and wants to bring forward the meeting. What's your name and where do you come from, mate? What's your good name and where are you coming from, uncle? Okay. So, uncle is like a term of respect for uh, somebody older or? I would say, uh, you know, Indians try to fit people into certain familial roles. So if you're referring to an older man, uh, you would always refer to him as your uncle and not just with your first name. For example, if I'm speaking with Gideon, I would say Gideon uncle instead of Gideon. Okay. Out of respect. Thank you. I just put mate for all of London English, but there are lots of varieties. But anyway, you know what I mean. This morning, I took a flight to Delhi at the last moment. Uh, this morning, I air dashed to Delhi. Although, to be completely honest, I don't use it as frequently as others, but I suppose it's one of the forms of Indian English. Is that because you don't air dash or because you don't use the phrase air dash? I do not use the phrase. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, anyway, uh, thank you, Ajay. Now, you guys, uh, air dash a flight to India. Get yourself a masala dosa and a chai masala and start speaking Indian English. And see you in the next video. Bye. Be sure to have some chicken curry as well. Thanks a lot, Gideon. Bye. -bye. <laughs>